Hi, and welcome once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. Here again in England. Hallelujah. Uh, where we will be for the next few months. And it's been a, been a blessing, and we're sure it will continue to be a blessing. Yeah. Uh, we're, con we're continuing on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. <coughs> you have to excuse me, a little, little English throat here, I'll tell you what. <laughs> It's, uh, it's uh, June as we do this, and it's a little cold and damp out there, especially for kids from Florida. That's right. All right. Um, we're, we're continuing on. This is our 22nd chapter, 22nd part of our study in the Sermon on the Mount. The most radical, wonderful teaching ever. Uh, Jesus' most complete and first longest sermon. Mm -hmm. we, we left off last week talking about storing up our treasures, having treasures, and and got to that place where Jesus says, no man can serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon. That's right. And that's where we're going to pick it up now. But I'd like to just start with a little asking God to bless our time together. Father, we just thank we thank you that we can gather in your name, in the name of your son, Christ Jesus. Lord, here and, and across the internet, Lord God, we, we thank you for the technology that allows us to reach out with your word. Oh knowing that your word never goes forth without accomplishing your purpose, Lord God. Jesus. And Lord, it's our desire, all of us, just to, to hear your voice and to learn from you, Lord. Lord, that we might make that transition from, from being religious to living righteous, Lord God, because it's our desire to live righteously, that men would see the things that we do and glorify you. They would see your life in us, Lord God. Jesus that your light would shine in us and through us to touch the lives of others. So we just ask your blessing on your word as we gather and study it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right, so we're, in, uh, we're studying the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. We're in chapter 6 right now, and we're going to start off uh, in verse 24. Mm -hmm. As I said, okay, Jesus said, No one... Now that's without, you have to understand, we take the, the Word of God, we take the Bible very literally and seriously. Yes. So when it says no one, that's exactly what it means. No one. There's not an exception to this, okay? It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, how holy you are, how long you've been saved. Uh, you know, it's no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now I'm going to say, I'm using the New American Standard Bible, and it says you can't serve God and wealth. Some translations say God and money, but that's because it's trying to communicate a concept that we have difficulty with today. Now, there's nothing wrong with money. Money in and of itself is not evil. It's a tool. It, well, it is, and it, it, and it should be. It's, you know, it's a and what it says in Scripture is that the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Mm -hmm. So what we're talking about here, when if you're talking about wealth um, or love of money, love of money is greed, and greed, Paul says, is idolatry, yes. right? So, but we are talking about when wealth is having a desire for or having more than you need, mm -hmm. all right? That's that's literally what riches are, what wealth is. Is having more, having an abundance more than you need, and you know there will be times when God gives us an abundance. But the purpose of abundance is that we might meet the need of others. That's, right. That's what it says in Scripture. That's what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. <clears throat> okay, but you can't serve God and wealth. No, this is about who you will serve. Okay. Everything in life boils down to this. Because you're going to serve somebody. Jesus Christ said, you're either for me or you're against me. No man can serve two masters, but you are going to serve one master. Jesus also said, you are either a slave of righteousness or a slave to sin. But either way, you're a servant, you're a slave to something. Either righteousness or sin. Everybody serves somebody. 
The issue of who you serve is all important because it has to do with worship. Okay. And worship has to do with recognizing the awesomeness of God. Humbling yourself, bowing before the King of Kings, the, the Lord of Lords, the King of Glory. Um, you know, Isaiah goes into the throne room and it has a vision in Isaiah chapter 6. And he stood before the throne, right? Yes. Yeah. And his immediate reaction was, I'm a sinful man. I'm a man of unclean lips. It's a humbling experience to come into the, into the presence of the living God. It should be a humbling experience. Yes. If it is not, you're in serious trouble. You're in significant trouble if it's not a humbling experience. But let me just go back to kind of the beginning of the formation of the people of God as a nation, as a people, right? I'm going to read something. Before you go on, let me yeah. just be, when you said that, it, you should be humble when you come into his presence. Is it possible for anybody to come into his presence and not be humble? Absolutely, positively. Although I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand how that can be. Mm -hmm. Except that people have hardened their hearts. Okay. And so filled with pride that they have... They, they They're be, so full of themselves. <clears throat> that their mind becomes debased, right? Okay. Okay. In, here in the Sermon on the Mount, and we will you know, get to this at some point, at the end, towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 7, Jesus talks about in that last day, that final day, that day of judgment, when people come to him. Mm -hmm. He said, many will come to him on that day, and they'll be saying, Lord, Lord, look what I did in your name. Let me, let me read this to you, right? Matthew chapter 7. 22? Exactly. 21. No, I'm going to start at, uh, I'll, 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 thank you, I'll start for your behalf on verse 21. Mm -hmm. 721. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. You know, because you can call him Lord and not make him Lord. That's right. And in verse 22 it says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons. And in your name perform many miracles. And Jesus said, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What lawlessness? Was it lawlessness that they cast out demons in his name? Or prophesied in his name? Or perform? No, no, the lawlessness is that they don't recognize the awesomeness, the su su supremacy of God Almighty there in their midst. They come into the presence of the living God. They come into the presence of Jesus Christ. Standing there on that day with an outstretched, nail-scarred hands. And they say, look what I did. Right, right. It's a focus on themselves. When you are a person of worship, and remember, Jesus said to the woman at the well that the day is coming, that God seeks those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Right. To worship Him is to humble yourself, to bow down before Him, and proclaim the greatness of God. These are people coming and proclaiming their own greatness. So yes, is it possible to come into His presence and not be overwhelmed with reverence for God, for awe of God? Yes, it is. But, it, you know, it took practice. Yes. It took practice to ignore God and focus on yourself. Mm -hmm. Pride is insidious. Pride is dangerous. It is the most dangerous thing known to man. Because it's the gateway to all sin. It says in Proverbs chapter 6 that, that there are six things, yea, even seven, that are an abomination to the Lord. The first one is haughty eyes, mm -hmm. pride. It's the first one because it's the gateway. It opens the door to all sin. Mm -hmm. Right? So we need to be, how do, you, how do you be on guard against pride? Well, first of all, practice what it says. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will exalt you. You choose to deny yourself, to die to yourself. But the other thing is, it says in Hebrews chapter 12, that we're to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. The author, the perfecter of our faith. Not be looking at yourself, but to be looking at the living God. To be looking at Jesus Christ. What He did. This, you know, Paul says that salvation is a free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is nothing that you did do to deserve the grace of God, yeah. the salvation of God. There is nothing that you can do to deserve or earn that salvation of God. It's not of works that any man should boast, because that's what man would do, would be to boast. Mm -hmm. 
It is the atoning work of Jesus Christ and only the atoning work of Jesus Christ on that cross that has brought us into a right relationship with God the Father. Nothing else. <clears throat> okay, so who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve God or are you going to serve mammon, this wealth, mm -hmm. this, this riches? Now what I was going to say is back in the beginning when God was forming his people. Now remember, there's been a family. This started, the, the church starts. A lot of people say, well, the church started on Pentecost. I don't agree with that. Because the church is a gathering of believers mm -hmm. in the presence of God. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Adam and Eve were gathered in the presence of God. Yes, they were. All right? They were the people of God. That's, that that, was that family was the first church. Mm -hmm. All right? And it grows from there. And then it's like, that's how church becomes. It starts as a family, it grows. But it grows as a family. Because the church is, through the promise of God, the sons of Abraham, the family of Abraham. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. He Through the child of the promise, who was... Isaac. You can't number the stars, you can't number the grains of sand on the earth, you can't number the myriads of, of mm -hmm. people who would come from Abraham. Mm -hmm. But it's a family affair. Mm -hmm. So now that family, through Joseph, winds up in Egypt. And then a Pharaoh arises, I'm giving you the whole history of the world here. Mm -hmm. The Pharaoh arises who doesn't know Joseph and begins to oppress the Hebrews, mm -hmm. the family of God. Mm -hmm. So there they are, they're in Egypt, the people of God, the Hebrews, the Jews, the family of Abraham. Mm -hmm. They are in Egypt, and they're being oppressed by harsh taskmasters under the authority of the Pharaoh. Right. All right? So listen to this now. This is from Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 and 23. God has commissioned Moses, and he is sending him into Egypt. And he says to Moses, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says Yahweh, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Mm -hmm. But think about what God said here through Moses. Let my son go, that he may serve me. Right? right. Now, do you understand what's going on here? God was freeing his people from the bondage of Egypt because no man can serve two, two masters. masters. Mm. They could not serve Pharaoh and serve, serve God. God. Right. Now, hmm. the Lord had to deliver his people from Egypt. The world, the ruler of the world, because that's basically what he was and what he represented to Pharaoh, so that they would be able to serve him. Because no man can serve two masters. Now, before we go any further, this requires an understanding of authority to grasp what Jesus is saying. Because when you're talking about serving, you're talking about authority, right? Yes. We yes. are instructed in the Word of God over and over and over, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, to be submitted, submit to authority, to authority right? Mm -hmm. Having said that, the prime ordinance is this. In James 4, 7, it says, Submit therefore to God. So above all, you have to submit to God. Why? Because all authority comes from God. Okay? All authority comes from God. Not just in the church, not to the pastors, but to every, every ruler in the world has received their authority from God. Not just because, not because they're good or bad or what have you, because it serves His purpose. Mm -hmm. He appoints princes, it says in the Word. Right. Think about this, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, but he, Pontius Pilate, entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, this is when Jesus is on trial for his life, yes. and he said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you, and I have authority to crucify you? He's saying, now, I, I, your life is in my hand. I have the authority to, to let you go, to crucify you. And Jesus answered and said to him, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. For this reason, who, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Jesus said to Pontius Pilate, You know, your authority, 
Pontius Pilate was not a, a stupid man, not a dummy. You don't get to, to be place. a place That's in the right. Roman Empire, you know, in charge of an entire dominion of the Roman Empire, and be a stupid. Mm -hmm. So he when he wouldn't he's, last long. Right. Long. And when he says, when Jesus says to him, you wouldn't have any authority unless it came to you from above, he's not talking about from the Caesar. No. Right? And Pontius Pilate knew, knew that. that. That's right. This frightened Pilate. Mm. All right? Because Jesus is saying, the authority that you have, you have because my Father gave it to you. And it will serve his purpose. So therefore, we have to submit ourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority. That's what Peter wrote, 1 Peter 2.13. We're to be submitted to authority, but let me just go back. So while in Egypt, the Lord required the people to submit to the Pharaoh's authority. Let me ask you this. Is the, you said all authority comes from God. Absolutely. And the purpose of all authority coming from God is for the purpose of serving Him? It serves serving His, his purpose. purpose. Okay. That, that doesn't mean that they're righteous or exactly. good or anything okay. else. You know, uh, we're not getting into a whole study of what happened in Egypt. Pharaoh, God had Pharaoh's heart in His hand. Yes. God chose to harden it. Right? Yes. Because it served His purpose. But there is no authority on earth lest God permits it to exist. All right? <clears throat> so if God has spoken over and over by His Holy Spirit through the writers of the Old Testament and New Testament and said that we are being submitted to authority, including what I just read, mm -hmm. submit yourself to, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, mm -hmm. God required His people to be submitted to Pharaoh. So if Pharaoh is oppressive, God can do a couple of different things. He can smite the Pharaoh, mm -hmm. which you wound up doing, mm -hmm. and or he can bring those people out. out. So they're no longer obligated. They're not Obligate under his authority. His authority. Right. And they're free from it. Mm -hmm. And that's what he chose to do. He sent Moses into the land to free the people, to release the people from the authority of Pharaoh so that they would not be subjected to his authority. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right, now listen to this. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus called them his apostles, his disciples, his apostles to himself, and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles, that's the unsaved, lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. All right. These words, let me give you a different, just a slightly different bent on this. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. As a matter of fact, I think one of the translations says, to master it over them, to be master. Mm -hmm. All right? They act as master when they lord it over. Right. Okay? Authority may come through a channel of a number of people, okay? okay? Yes. But there can only be one Authority. master. Right, right. Okay? Now, the head. I want you to get this right, mm -hmm. all right? Because it's like uh, that in the household, the father is supposed to be the head of the household, the authority. He can delegate. He can delegate. Mm -hmm. Let's say he delegates to the mother mm -hmm. authority over, over the children and, you know, right. all right. So the mommy can tell the children to do something. Mm -hmm. She's still not the master. No. She has authority. Yes. But there still can only be one master. master. And as a matter of fact, the daddy's not the master because he received his authority from God. That's this true. All authority goes back to God. All godly authority goes back to God, all right? Mm -hmm. All right. You can, you can be in rebellion to that, and rebellion is his witchcraft. Right. But the fact of the matter is you have channels. There's a president or CEO of a corporation. Mm -hmm. And there's a, you know, if you've ever been involved in any aspect of corporate life or worked any place, you know that you've got a boss over you, he's got a boss over him, he's got a boss over him. There's a chain and, of authority. And there's a chain of authority. There's a chain of command is what we usually call it. Right. There can be that chain, but there can only be one master. Mm -hmm. Now, a, a really good example of this is uh, the centurion. Right. Okay? So I'm going to read you that passage from the Gospel of Matthew. This is from the 8th chapter of Matthew. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him 
imploring him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word, my servant will be healed. Listen to this now. For I also am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. You see, there is the binding together of faith and authority, yes. right? Obedience and authority. Mm -hmm. But the first thing the centurion says is, I am a man under authority. Right. And then he talks about the people under, under, him. under him who he has authority over. Right. All right? So there is that chain, but that doesn't make him master. No. Right. Okay? We have to recognize that God gives us, every, God gives us all authority in, of, on, in something. All right? Yes. That's the way he works. He is the author, which is where the word authority comes from, by the way. Mm -hmm. right? Nothing came into being without him. He's the author of all things. So he has authority over all things. And he delegates authority. When he created Adam and, and then placed him in the garden, he gave him dominion over the works of his own hand, right? Mm -hmm. Well, he was delegating authority. He was delegating authority and responsibility to him. Right. So, but you can't have two masters. And, and part of the problem is, a lot of places today, it's like, we, we live in rebellious times, okay? Very, very, very. Now, Alice and I are both from the United States of America, and I say that this is a nation that was born in rebellion. They call it revolution, the American Revolution. We're coming up on July 4th here. It's a celebration of a rebellion. You know, hey, get upset with me, but rebellion is, is witchcraft. The fact of the matter is we're called to be submissive to governing authorities. We have to stay focused on the fact that, that you can't have, because, uh, because we don't like authority. We, we talk about being independent. You know, it's a celebration of independence from, from what? Well, it was independence from governing authority, right. right? A lot of places today, they don't want to have anybody over them. You know, we, we do a democracy. A democracy is basically, okay, the, that guy in charge, you know, he's there because we want him there. He gets... And listen, this is part of what the Constitution of the United States of America says. That the people in authority on top, like the President of the United States, mm -hmm. they derive their authority from the people below. That's what All the Constitution right. says. Yeah. No, it's exactly backwards That's from right. what Scripture says. That's right. All authority comes from, from above. above, not from below. And that's infected and affected the church today. That people don't want to sub be submitted to authority. They don't want a man to... Well, the problem is, they, and then they, I hear all the time about, well, the bad experiences they've had. Well, the fact that people do it in a wrong fashion doesn't justify you doing it in a wrong. Right. You know, I mean, how many times have you heard the old saying, you know, two, two wrongs don't make a right. right. Okay, so we need, to, we need to get back to this place where we understand authority because it is so incredibly important. It relates, Jesus said, you know, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? Mm -hmm. You cannot separate faith from authority. Yeah. Because faith works by the fact that God has authority over all things. All right? And this is the order that he made it in. It is good order. And yes. God is a God of good order. Yes. He is not a God. Because otherwise you have chaos. Otherwise you have confusion. Um, when we begin to understand this, that because the fact is you're going to be under somebody's authority. Right. There is no, Jesus Christ, when he's on this earth, you know what he said? He said, I don't speak anything unless I heard it from the Father. He mm -hmm. said, I don't do anything unless the Father's told me to do it. He was a man under authority. He was God and man, but under authority. It says in Philippians chapter 2, you know, that, that not considering being equal with God a thing to be rest, he emptied himself, and he was obedient. Right? Obedient even to death, death on a cross. He was under authority. There's not one of us that isn't supposed to be subject to somebody's authority. The question becomes, when you want to have you know, a multitude of leaders because you don't want to have one person 
quote unquote lording it over you and that's not God's intention to have anybody lord it over you there is only as Paul says one lord there is only one master there can be a chain of command and we derive our strength from <coughs> God and that's the, the, the master the authority. He, he's the only and he's got this order and it's and so many people have heard this before it's like a chain and if you take a link out of that chain it loses the strength. No matter which chain you take out. No matter, no matter which link, which link you take out. And you know what? You can't you have multiple that, links. You know, yeah. that, that chain of command is Straight. link after link after like link after line. link. It doesn't come down and then divide the 97 different no, links going no. off in different directions. No. Um, okay. The centurion, who so impressed Jesus, and he did so impress Jesus, understood that he was in the middle of a chain of command. Right. Okay? Right. So, yes, you know, a child can have a mother over him mm -hmm. and a father over that mm -hmm. and, you know, and go on and on and on. Or if you are at work, you can have a direct manager and that man answers to another manager and that man answers to a vice president and that vice president answers to a president. Right. You can have that chain of command, but they can't, it can't be parallel. It's got to be, you know, Stop vertical. Supported right? By the right. It's got to be vertical. Master. You you can have lots of people in authority over you, but you can only have one master over you. That's right. And this is why, for example, when the apostles were told, do not preach the name of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. This is Peter speaking, for example, who is one of the people in the New Testament who says, submit yourself to governing authority. And yet, when the when the Sanhedrin said you cannot preach the name of Jesus Christ, he said, "Well, you be the you be the judge whether we should be submitted to God, you know, or to you, because you can't." They're trying to master it. They're trying to lord it over. They're they're stepping outside the bounds of the authority that God has given them. Right. They didn't have the authority. Because God them. will never say, "Don't preach the name exactly. of Jesus Christ." Exactly. And and uh, I don't, I I so easily side my track myself. Sidetrack yourself. Is that what I said? Oh, I need an aspirin. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, God has created things. He will not. He will not call you to for you to do things that are contradictory Never. to His word Never. and His command. Absolutely not. And this I hear from people that want to debate and argue all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I tell wives. Wives are supposed to be submitted to your husbands. Well, what if he tells me to do this? Wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute. It, the, it, the, one, the one thing that has always come up whenever that's stated is, well, what if he tells me to go kill somebody? That's the one they always come up with. Well, okay. That, that's, what if your husband tells you to go kill somebody? And you know that God is not going to ever put you in that situation. <clears throat> well, you, listen, there are evil people out there. Yeah. So what do you do if, God tells you, if, if your husband tells you to go kill somebody? You say, am I going to be obedient to you or obedient to God? Obedient to God. To get, he would, he's the difference, you to do something the difference God's was, will. listen to this now, mm -hmm. this is important. Right. The difference is that when Peter and John the Apostles refused to obey the Sanhedrin because they were telling them to do something they knew to be contrary to the command of God, the authority of God, right. they were willing to pay the price. That's the consequence. They didn't rebel. They didn't start an uprising. Mm -hmm. They didn't create a rebellion against the Sanhedrin. They said, you be the judge. And they went. They were beaten for being obedient to God rather than man. Yeah. And they went out rejoicing Amen. that they were considered worthy to suffer for the sake of Jesus Christ. Right. You have to be prepared to suffer the consequence of standing under the authority of God. But you can't serve two masters. Yeah. You can't say, I'm serving God, and then serve something that you know is opposed to God. Right. But you are still never allowed to rebel. That's, right. That's the Word of God. That's right. You're never allowed to rebel. Rebellion is witchcraft. You are allowed to stand fast and disobey ungodly commands, right. but you have to still stay submitted to them right. and pay the penalty for it. Right. Like Daniel. Yes. When he was commanded not to pray, he prayed. But you want to know something? 
He didn't pray just because he was commanded not to. Was it was his, his habit. That's what yeah. it says. It was his practice. Mm -hmm. So he went and did it. And then he got thrown down into the lion's den. What did he do? He moaned and said, Oh God, look what they're doing. They're going to kill me. No, he didn't. He did not. And what did God do? He sent an angel to shut up the mouth of those lions. That's right. And then the people that drew him in were devoured by the very same mm -hmm. lions. And their family. Same thing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the time of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. Mm -hmm. They refused to bow down to an idol. And they were willing to go into the furnace if that was the cost of being obedient to God. That's right. And God delivered them. The point is, God will deliver you. Yes. You need to stand fast. But you need to understand that you have to be totally submitted. You can't do this on your own. You can't lean on your own understanding. You've got to know the Word of God. You've got to stand fast on the Word of God. And you have to serve God. You have to serve Him because He is the Master. You know, I've said this before. If somebody asked me once, what's the great, in, in all the decades that I've been serving yeah, the Lord, yeah. what is the one single thing that is most important that I've learned? And it is this. Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm not. And you want to know something else? Nobody else is. There's only one Lord. Mm -hmm. There are people in my life who are in authority in my life. You want to know who's in authority in my life? The cop that's walking down the street. Mm -hmm. You want to know who's in authority in my life? I'm in England. I'm not even a citizen of England. But I still have to be submissive to their, to their laws. I have to be, I've got to be submitted. I've got to be obedient to the traffic laws, to whatever laws mm -hmm. there are. You know, I have no justification not to just because I'm not a citizen of this nation. They all have authority in my life, but it's God-given authority, and it won't, you know, if it conflicts, it, I haven't, I've driven down the street and I've seen signs on the street that say, okay, the speed limit's 40 miles an hour. I haven't driven down the street and seen things that say, okay, go kill somebody. Yeah. I, I will, however, I, and I will tell you this, for example, here in the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. put this on record, why don't I? It is against the law in England, as it is in many, many nations of the world mm -hmm. today, and in many places in the United States, mm -hmm. to speak out against sin. Yes. When that sin happens to be now an accepted part of the culture of the land. Mm -hmm. For example, homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to tell you something before we get too far afield. I, so homosexuality is a sin. Yes. Most definitely. So is divorce. Yes. I don't know why the church has come to accept one and reject the other, but that's another story. So, but it's against the law to speak out against homosexuality here in this country, mm -hmm. because that's called hate speech. How upside down is that? How upside down is that? When God speaks about it because He is bringing a word of love. That's all right? right. And healing. I have preached here in the United Kingdom and I have said as I began to preach, I know that what I am about to say is against the law. But I am compelled to say it because it is the Word of God. Right. Now what happens if somebody comes in and hears me saying that? Mm -hmm. What happens if somebody here in the United Kingdom hears this study that we're doing right now that will go out over the internet tomorrow? Mm -hmm. They can come to me and say, okay, you're going to jail for doing this. What am I going to say? Okay. Praise the Lord. That, well, hallelujah. Now i got a prison ministry. The, the fact of the matter is, I have to be submitted to God. Yes. They cannot tell me to do something contrary to what God has told me to do. That's right. They can, however, enforce their authority that God has given them. Mm -hmm. They can abuse their the authority. authority that God has given them. If they abuse their authority, that's between yeah. them and God not between them and me. Mm -hmm. And I have to have enough faith and trust in the author of all authority Amen. that he is able, capable of dealing with that situation. Amen. I don't need to take that situation into my own hands or lean to, try, on your own to try and deal with that's it. Right. Because that's when everything goes pear-shaped, as they mm -hmm. say here in the UK. Mm -hmm. When you take the thing into your own hands and try and rectify it. You can't, you shouldn't, you better not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here I go. The reason Jesus said you can't serve two masters is because you will hate one and love the other. Mm -hmm. Now, the one master who is faithful and true, you know his name? You know his name? Yeshua. Okay. This is what he says. And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, 
He must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his soul himself? That was Luke chapter 9. Jesus, his speech, well, let me just tell you what the other guy says. Mm -hmm. The other master, remember, Jesus is saying there's two masters, God and mammon. But mammon is not the master. That's an idol. The love of money, greed, is an idol. It's an, all idols point back to the one who would be, who is in total rebellion to God, Satan, right? right. He's a liar by nature and the father of lies. So Jesus, here's his promise. You follow me, you got to die to yourself. The devil comes along. Remember Jesus in the wilderness? Mm -hmm. The devil took him, Jesus, to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Matthew 4, 8 and 9. But of course, we know, as Jesus did, and that as Paul wrote to the Colossians, greed is idolatry. So he said, Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. No man can serve two masters. The thing is, Jesus promises things that excite the spirit. Satan promises things that excite the flesh. He promised Jesus, the world, if you only bow down and serve me, you can have all of these treasures. Jesus said, come follow me. What are you going to get? You're going to lose your life. You're going to die to yourself. Isn't that right? right. Jesus said it to worship him by serving right. him. So listen to this now. The flesh is in conflict with the spirit. That's what Paul says. Constant conflict with the spirit. Because the spirit demands the death of the flesh. You get that? The spirit demands the death the, of the flesh. The spirit flesh. and flesh are in conflict mm -hmm. because the spirit demands the death of the flesh. The one walking in the Spirit, the person who walks in the Spirit, will say, like Paul, for I have died and my life is hidden in Christ Jesus. Right? Right? Colossians 3.3 3. Mm -hmm. The Spirit within demands the death of the flesh. Mm -hmm. The flesh, the natural man, is the ally of the serpent who comes to destroy, to kill, to eradicate life. The life is the Spirit. So there is absolutely no peaceful coexistence in this war. No. <laughs> the flesh should not... Listen, God formed Adam out of the dust. There's the flesh. Yes. Then he breathed life into him. That's the, the spirit. spirit. Life is the spirit. The flesh has no life. No. Your flesh is dying. You know, you can sit there, oh, hallelujah, my, our God is a healing God. I need that touch right now. Praise God. Amen. He is a healing God. Yes, he is. God can heal me of this silly little cold I have right now, but you want to know something? This flesh is still dying. That's right. Decaying. As Decaying. You sit there. I say, look it. Take, <laughs> take a quick look. Quick look. I'm sitting here rotting before your very eyes. What's up? There? Yes, you are. You got a kick out of that, eh? Yeah, you like that? Okay. But it's a fact. I mean, I'm not going to carry this flesh into eternity. Praise God for that. Mm. All right? My life is not this flesh. My life is my spirit. So Satan, who comes as a thief to kill, to steal, to destroy, he has come to kill life. So he is a master of the flesh. The reason that there is this constant conflict is because this is a, death, this is a fight to the death. Yes. The spirit, the spirit of God within you bears witness with your spirit that your flesh has to die. And it has to die now before, before it decays and turns back into dust. Mm -hmm. right? For I've died and my life is in Christ Jesus. Satan, on the other hand, is trying to kill your life. He's trying spirit. to take your life. He's trying to kill your spirit. Mm -hmm. He is the Lord of the flesh. Yes. Okay. And the Lord of the flies. Well, yeah, no, it's true. That's exactly what the Lord called him. Yes. And if you want to know why he called him the it's Lord of the flies, just think flies. about what flies got him. Okay. You cannot serve God and wealth. 
The, now, here's something I think very few people really, really get. Mm. Let's deal with first things first. Okay. Wealth is not a servant. Wealth is a master. Mm. Now, think about this, because I just don't think that people Understand. get this. Yeah. This is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. He's the truth. He says you can't serve two masters, God and wealth. Wealth, wealth is a master. Is a master. Mm. Everybody thinks that wealth will give them control over things. Mm -hmm. They have control been led them. to believe that wealth will serve them mm -mm. and give them mastery over everything in life. Mm. Yeah. This is really, I mean, this is really, really important. But it's hard to grasp. And I just don't think people see this. Right? Wealth, according to Jesus Christ, who is the Word, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, who is the truth, says that wealth will put you in bondage because it is a master, mm -hmm. a harsh taskmaster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I just heard you say out there, I heard, I heard it. Mm -hmm. You said, oh, no, 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 not me. If I had money, I'd do good with it. I'd, just, I'd, I'd yeah. give this, I'd do it. You've been deceived. You have been deceived. You've been lied to all of your life. You believed it with all of your heart before you were saved. And maybe even a little bit after. You've been told forever that if you only had money, this situation would be okay. That situation, you'd be able to control this. You'd be able to control you'd be able that. To fix everything. If you had money, you'd be in charge. Mm -hmm. No, if you had money, the money would be in charge. Money is a master. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus Christ said. I, I, I want I want you to get this. I want you to understand this because we've got this backwards. We've yes. been lied to so yes. long, so loud that we've really come to believe it. Mm -hmm. If we only had money. Everything would be okay because we'd be able to use the money to serve us. Wouldn't happen. No, you would be serving the money. Yes. You can't serve two masters. Wealth is a master, yes. not a servant. Praise God. Jesus Christ said, mm. uh, think about this. Telling, listen, he's telling a parable. The parable of the sower and the seed. Yes. And he says, if you don't understand this parable, mm. you will not understand yes. any of the parables. Jesus said, but talking about seed planted, mm -hmm. but the worries of the world mm -hmm. and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. You know, Alice and I, I think I shared this I've recently, but I'll share it again. We were sitting in Sarasota, Florida a number of years ago with some friends uh, very, very astute financial counselors, you know, Christian financial counselors, very people very dedicated to the Lord, very sold out to the Lord. And we're sitting around having lunch in Sarasota, and in the middle of the conversation, one of the, one of the folks, uh, Gary Moore, as a matter of fact, I mean, Gary, a dear brother, and one of the most knowledgeable people on finances in the world, literally, said to me in, in passing, I don't remember the context, he said, well, you know, money, the world says money talks. And I said, absolutely. And I said, you know, Jesus said the same thing. And he looked at me and said, what? I said, well, yeah, Jesus said the same thing. The world says money talks, so does Jesus. He said money talks. The only difference is Jesus said it lies. That's right. You have to beware of the deceitfulness of riches. Because what money does, it sits there and it tells you it can make everything all right. It can fix any problem that you have. It can give you power to do anything that you want. This is what money tells you. It's the deceitfulness of riches. And Jesus warned against it. Money wants to master you. Wealth wants you in bondage to it. And that's what happens to most people that wind up with wealth. Listen to me. Solomon, the richest man that probably ever lived, known throughout the world for thousands of years for his wealth. 3,000 years ago, here's what Solomon wrote, and it came from his heart because he knew it to be the fact. 
He said that those who love silver and gold will not be satisfied with silver and gold. He tried. He found out that it doesn't work. It doesn't satisfy. When Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? Gain, gain the world. How much riches are there in the world? Well, you know, it's probably a little worse today than it was five, six years ago. But um, if you take all of the riches of the world, now remember, we're talking about not just the money sitting in banks, the money sitting in the pockets of every human person. Right. We're talking about every diamond under the ground. We're talking about every piece of gold sitting in port. We're talking about all, all of the, the wealth of the world. He said, all. What would it gain a man to, what would it profit a man to gain all the world? Which is what Satan offered him, by the yes, way. Yes. You're talking about roughly 100 billion squillion dollars. Squillion. Yeah, a billion squillion dollars. Billion. Or a quillion billion squillion dollars. All right. It's, I mean, it's a, a it, bunch. It's got yes. It's got a whole bunch of zeros at the end, and then it's got little numbers at the end. Those are the, the you know, square cubed. Oh, and, yeah. yeah. I mean, yes. yeah. Do you realize that one human soul? One human being's salvation is worth, in the eyes of God, who, is, who knows what's going on, worth more than that quillion, squillion, billion, teen dollars. Mm. We have been deceived to think that it's all about money. And you want to know something? We're living in the last days. We're living in a time when God said, do you really believe that? Well, let's see how well money will work for you. When you get through this Bible study, maybe just go to Google News or someplace and see how well it's working out for Greece. Spain. Or Spain. Mm. Or Portugal. Mm. Or Italy. Or Ireland. Ireland, yeah. Or the United States of America. That's right. Or here in England. Mm -hmm. It's Anywhere collapsing. In the world. It's collapsing because it made promises, wealth, money, riches, made promises that it could not keep. It's like a one. It's like one big sinkhole. And people bowed down and worshipped it. Yes. People have been serving mm. mammon mm. for century after century after century, and now they reap what they have sowed. Ah, now that it makes that next verse so much clearer. The next verse. Yes. Can't serve God and wealth. All right, but just but just think about that expression of Jesus that the the, the wealth, the deceitfulness of riches, will choke the word. Yes. Um, this is what it wants to do. It chokes the word in somebody's life. Satan hates Jesus. He can't do a thing about Jesus. He gave that his best shot mm -hmm. two thousand years ago on a little hill outside mm -hmm. of Jerusalem. That that didn't work. But he still wants to choke to kill till you choke something to kill it. That's right. Right. He wants to choke that word, the word that is the seed of life, that brings life. Peter talks about that word of God is that imperishable seed that brings life. That's how, listen, if you're sitting here, you're saved, you know, you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. It's because that word was planted in you. Satan wants to come along and choke it off and kill it, literally kill it. Well, that's what he said, that the deceitful deceitfulness of riches does. We, we have to, I know, I, listen, I know how difficult this is, and it's difficult because you have been so, that's what I said before, you have heard this all, you, all of your life, you have been told that money is the answer. It's another purple grass, isn't it? it but it's incredible. Yes. I mean, because I this, this has been that. forever. Yeah. It's been forever. You have heard that money is the answer. That's always, yeah. Okay? Jesus said riches doesn't pro they don't profit. So what they don't profit, and he's saying you can't, you know what it does, you know what it does is you can't serve two masters, mm -hmm. it is taking you away from serving God. Right, right. Because you're focused on what it can't do. A mindset on money is a mind which has turned its back on God Almighty. It's that simple. 
And then the next verse says, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life. Well, let me just stop right there. I, as I said, I'm reading the New American Standard. It says, for this reason, because you can't serve God in money, because you can't do that, now I'm saying to you this. The King James says, therefore. The literal translation says, therefore. Or the Young's literal translation says, because of this. You've got to get this. Jesus Christ, he's saying this. He's teaching this to his apostles in the beginning of the ministry saying you can't serve the world's wealth and God, mm -hmm. and because you can't, you don't be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And you know what this is saying to me, is that if you are serving money and wealth, this anxiety for all of this will be, that's, that's a fruit of it. You're going to be anxious about that's it. That's right. You, if you're not serving God, it, you know, it says, the, what does your say? You might be anxious? Anxious. Yeah, Alice has the New American Standard also. She's got the earlier edition. Mine says, Jesus said, don't be worried about what your life. And that says, don't be anxious. Anxious is the right word. It's anxiety. Right. Do you know that anxiety is one of the biggest problems in the yes. world today? People are just absolutely totally. filled with anxiety. They're worried about how they're going to pay the next month's rent. They're worried about what they're going to eat. They're worried about how are they going to pay for their kids' school. They're worried about this and worry, 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 worry. But that's an indication of who you're serving. It means you're not serving God. Exactly. That's exactly that's right. That's the point. And Jesus is explaining this to his apostles right. and his disciples. Right. At the very beginning, remember, let's go back and not lose sight of the fact. I know, you know, it's been uh, 22 weeks since we started this study. But we said at the very beginning of this, Jesus has gathered his disciples and named his apostles from that group. Mm -hmm. And now, before he sends them out as the light of the world and the salt of the earth into the world, he is training them in righteousness. Yes. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is, is training in living righteously. So now he's saying to them, you know, you can't, if you're going to serve God, now obviously, I mean, you know, the, the, that's, the, that's the assumption here, that's the default position, is that we want to serve God. That's why they're sitting there listening to Jesus Christ. And he's saying, well, you can't serve money too. Because if you do, you can't serve God. So now I'm telling you, don't be worried about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. If you're serving God, you won't be worried about what you wear, what you eat, or what you drink, or your life. No, why because is that? you'll be trusting in Him. Why is that? Because He provides for why, everything. Why is that? And He never fails. Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? Because He said it. Uh, because perfect love casts yes. out fear. fear. When your love for Christ is perfected, and you know that His love for you is perfect, right. you will have no worry. You That's will right. have That's no right. anxiety. Because, why? Why did he bring, let's go back to the beginning of this study, why did he bring the people out of bondage in Egypt? So that they could serve him. Right. What he is attempting to do right now, right this minute, as we bondage. gather in this study, is to deliver us from the bondage of Pharaoh, yes. who is sitting there telling you how to live and run your life, and you've got to serve him in order to do it. If you think that he was a harsh taskmaster, mm -hmm. Satan sitting there somewhere, you know, on your shoulder if you watch the cartoons, mm -hmm. and saying to you, oh, if you don't get some money, you're going to starve to death. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you don't get some money, you're, you're not going to be able to make the, the car streets. payment. If you don't get some money, you're not going to be mortgaged and you're going to be put on the street. Mm -hmm. All he wants you to do is be filled with anxiety and, wor and That's worry. Right. That's right. Jesus Christ said over, and it says over and over in Scripture. I mean over and over in Scripture, it says, fear not. Right. Fear not. Fear not. And one of the most beautiful, Isaiah 43 says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. You are mine, says the Lord. Mm -hmm. he, what did it cost him to redeem you? Jesus Christ. It cost him. It cost the Father, Jesus Christ, to redeem you. That's the price he paid. Mm -hmm. You were purchased with a price. The price that you were purchased with was Jesus Christ. If God the Father was willing to pay Jesus Christ, 
to save you, do you honestly think that he is not going to take care of you as to what you will eat, what you will wear, what you will drink, the things that are... Why do you think Paul had this confidence? Paul, who lived the Word of God, said he knew it. He said, my God shall supply all of your needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It's when you get that assurance. It's when you believe the, the, the Word. It's when you trust in God. When you let that perfect love abide in you that casts out all fear. You, that you will not worry about paying the mortgage next month. Mm -hmm. That you will not worry about the car payment next month. You will not worry about this and that and the other. And where is the money going to come from? Because you want to know something? God, our Father, owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Remember I talked about the billions and squillions and cobillions? They all belong to the Lord. Right. They don't belong to the United States. They don't belong in the, you know, the crown jewels ain't the crown jewels. They belong to God Almighty. Right. The, the money that is sitting in the Federal Depository in New York City doesn't belong to New York City or the United States. It belongs to God Almighty. It is His. And the, all the earth and the fullness thereof. A cattle on a thousand hills. It's all His. He has the ability to take care of you. Yes. Let Him be in charge. Yes. Let, him, let Him be the ruler of your life. Let Him be the one that you serve. Because you want to know something? He is not a harsh taskmaster. He is calling you to that place where there are green pastures and still waters. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He is not calling you to build pyramids and make bricks and not give you the straw to do it. He is not that kind of taskmaster. That's the world. That's the Pharaoh. That's the devil who sat in the throne there. Mm. God Almighty wants to bless you. He wants you at perfect peace. And the mind set on Him, set on His Word, will be at perfect peace. Hallelujah. That you can serve Him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Because you can't serve God. Mm -hmm. You cannot fix your eyes on Jesus Christ mm -hmm. while you keep glancing over at the bill from the electric company. That's right. You can't do it. No matter how hard you try, no matter how long you've been saved, no matter how spiritual you are, if your mind is focused on those things, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, you are not able. You don't have the ability to serve God. You may think you are, but you're lying to yourself. It is the deceitfulness of riches. Remember, the heart is deceitful above all else. Trust God. Trust God. Risk everything on God. We're going to talk about this on the, in the next session. I promise you, we are going to talk about getting to that place where you can stand and say, God, if you don't do it, it doesn't get done. I'm going to trust in you. I am going to risk everything on you. I am going to put my faith in you and nothing else. Because, Lord God Almighty, I want to serve you and you alone. For you are the Lord of my life. Amen. You are the master of my life. You are the God of my life. Right. And I will have no other. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. You be here for the next Amen. session of this Bible study. Praise you, Jesus. Don't miss it. Honestly, tell others to be there. Let's, let's just, and please, if you have questions or comments, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. We want to be able to share with you. We want to hear what God is speaking to you about these Amen. things. We are one body. There's only one body. One family. There's only one family. There's only one faith. And above all, there's only one Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So, until the next time, Father, I pray Amen. that each one of us would walk in that freedom that the Spirit of your, your Spirit brings. For whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And where your spirit is, there is liberty. Lord God, help us to walk in that freedom, that we might walk to that place where we continually serve, honor, and worship you. And Lord, let your light shine through us in such a way that people see the peace that is the fruit of your Holy Spirit in our lives and are drawn to us to find out as we proclaim the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. We praise you and thank you that you can use such foolish vessels as us. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Until next time, God bless you. Jesus loves you a lot.